Hello and welcome to a pre-recorded session of the IEEE International Symposium on Digital Privacy and Social Media, being held in San Jose on the 1st of August, 2022. My name is Katina Michael, I'm the chair of the symposium, and I'd like to give a shout out to the IEEE Consumer Technology Society for whom made this symposium possible. When they realized that they required this kind of interaction between a variety of stakeholders to come together to talk about pressing concerns in the creation of consumer electronics with respect to digital privacy and social media. I'd also like to thank for their support and panel uh, presentation, the IEEE Digital Privacy Initiative that's doing wonderful things within IEEE with respect to privacy. And of course, the IEEE Society on the Social Implications of Technology, whose technical committee, Socio-Technical Systems, led by Dr. Robert Abbas, is also supporting this event. Today we have with us Professor Roger Clark from Zamex Consultancy. He is also a well-known visiting professor at the University of New South Wales and the Australian National University. And he'll be talking today about consumer-oriented social media, key features, what's held it up and how we get it. Welcome Roger and welcome Dr. Robert Abbas. Thanks very much, Katina. Um, Good day, everybody. Uh, look, I'm a consultant uh, with research pretensions. Um, um, my days of tech expertise go back 25 to 50 years. So I, I'm going to have to come up with a justification as to why I'm speaking to a conference whose focus is on applying engineering solutions, but more on that progressively. Um, my game in recent decades has been in the strategic and policy implications of various kinds of IT. Um, uh, I've been a long-term admirer of people who have invested a huge amount of effort into privacy enhancing technologies. Um, now, I've written about them sporadically since about 2000, but I'm also a critic of what's been done in the pet space uh, because they've mostly achieved pretty poor take up. Um, I believe from previous work I've done that the reasons for this are that they're mostly standalone rather than being integrated into other products and integrated into people's ways of working. Uh, they're mostly not plug and play and not that simple to install and use. They're mostly inventions rather than innovations carried through the cycle. And to put it another way, they're mostly engineering solutions when what people actually need are solutions for people and for society. So let me uh, just bring up my slide set now. You don't need my face any longer than is actually essential here. So what I'm going to do is to have a look at uh, social media, and in particular what I've called for years consumer-oriented social media, privacy-friendly social media if you like, in the context of what's been inadequate about the pets revolution for the last 20 or 30 years. Um, so my basic pitch is going to be that we've actually got a lot of things already in place. Uh, well, when I say we, you, uh, the engineers of the world have done a lot of these sorts of things, um, but a few things are holding everything up and causing us to not achieve what's achievable uh, with, with real social media. Most of these problems are not tech engineering, they're social engineering or they're outright politics. But what I'm going to do is quickly flick through some of the things that I think are in place and achievable, and then finish up by identifying what I believe are the key impediments that we've got to address and how that needs to be done. So let me see whether I've got this functioning the way I want it to. So, the first and obvious thing is to get some clarity uh, in our minds about uh, what the generic needs are of consumer oriented social media. Um, I've left aside all of the um, non-functional um, mainstream requirements and just focused on those that are functional uh, things that have to be done about this if, they, if it's to work. And CIA is not adequate, but it's a starting point. But if we think about accessibility and think about the different thing, kinds of things that need to be accessed and the different kinds of categories of people who need to be authorised to gain that access, we're getting ourselves on track. Similarly, if we think about what are the conditions and what are the categories uh, where inaccessibility is what is required, I think we're getting closer. 
Then, of course, we've got integrity. And remember, it's about more than data and more than data in, in, in flight. It's, it's about social networks as well. And there's then a series of somewhat more technical requirements that uh, once, you, once you probe down underneath the bonnet. Uh, once again, I'm going to argue a great deal of that is in place. People know about how to do these things. People have implemented quite workable versions of these things. That's not the key impediment. Let's look at another aspect. Uh, the demand side of things. We've done supply, let's look at demand. Well, it's quite clear that consumer-oriented social media isn't for everybody. Uh, we've got to look at the segments where it, where it works, where it services a need. We're wasting our time if we're trying to sell people who are oblivious to risk. Uh, we're wasting our time if we're trying to sell to people who are simply reckless, uh, irrespective of their understanding of, uh, of what's going on in the world. And of course, there's hedonists out there, uh, by which I mean in this context, people who cheerfully trade their data uh, for essentially nothing um, in order to gain experiences that they uh, gain enjoyment from. Uh, so let's not waste our time going to those market segments. Let's uh, leave those to organisations uh, which can continue their digital surveillance economy approach. Now, on this slide, I've gathered together over the years uh, the many different categories of people who have got reasons to fear exposure. Um, the ones on the left hand side are the people we commonly think of as being a target uh, mark is not the right, right word, a target segment for these kinds of somewhat protected and in some cases highly protected services. And uh, lots of stories can be told and lots of analyses can be done of needs in each of these arenas. Um, that tells us some of the demand side, um, but it only tells us part of the demand side because if we look at the other side of things, what we see is organisational contexts. And in those organizational contexts, we have not just individuals and not just small scale associations, we have large uh, organizations with clout and with money. And those organizations can be marketed to in conventional ways with the right kinds of products. Now, all of these have got very similar kinds of requirements. Now, we've been here before because Tor came out of Naval Laboratories. Um, we are uh, in a position to um, uh, do uh, what we have been over recent years referring to as freemium premium kinds of splits. Uh, we're able to uh, leverage from, uh, from one uh, category of service to another category of service. And in this case, um, quite modest uh, amounts of differences are needed between, uh, between the two different contexts. So once again, in the, uh, when we look at the demand side of things, um, I think we've got uh, quite a lot of progress. This isn't one of the key impediments. So what about the architectural features, the way in which we string these things together? Um, <clears throat> we've got huge quantities of infrastructure out there. So the machine on which we're building is already very substantial and it's a relatively thin layer <clears throat> of application that has to be built over the top of these things if we get our architecture and our infrastructure right. And again, with all of these things, they're known, um, they're plannable, they're executable, there are exemplars out there, and in a lot of cases, there's pre-written um, um, and operational tools that can be applied. Um, one example that um, came to my mind was open applications architect architecture ideas following on from the old ISO OC diagrams from the 1970s and 1980s. That article I published in 1990, when I still had, I still had some uh, some uh, technical capabilities, um, and all of those principles were the probably now slightly differently drawn uh, diagram. This was long before the word uh, cloud had uh, emerged on the scene. Um, uh, this kind of thing is well understood. So this is this is not one of our blockages. Here's another area in which perhaps uh, some insights are needed and perhaps uh, some insights are lacking amongst, uh, amongst innovators. Uh, the concept of innovation has been written about since the 1950s by a bloke called Rogers. Um, and um, when you boil down what the descriptions are, what the needs are of a successful innovation, all of those have to do with perceptions of the target market. The individual segments must each perceive these things to be the case. And if they aren't the case, 
then the product has not been designed sufficiently well to, to reach that segment and some adaptations or some additional layering uh, or some changes in user interface are needed or in some cases some plug and play um, uh, ease of uh, ease of installation um, uh, are needed in order to overcome these kinds of impediments. Again, we've got a huge amount of knowledge out there and you can go and buy that, uh, uh, that knowledge as an entrepreneur. So another area of a problem, do we have enough exemplars out there? Well, if you look at the um, well-known ones on the left-hand side, they give us lots and lots of examples of what not to do. And there's been a lot of studies done of these things. A lot of people have listed out what the, uh, what the things are that have upset the public, that have endangered members of the public. We've also got to face up to the fact that some of the things that have been done in some of these products have been effective. Uh, some of it's pure hedonism, uh, but uh, quite a lot of it is features which we would need to, if not replicate, um, provide functional equivalence to uh, when, we, when we go forth with consumer-oriented social media. So even on the left-hand side, there's a huge amount of learning to be done. And on the right-hand side, uh, well, that list changes, not quite annually, but um, it uh, was several years since I'd updated uh, a list um, of, of this kind, and I had to uh, discover that quite a few names had disappeared out of sight, and several new and interesting ones had, had turned up. Um, in terms of the solution already on that list, I'm not convinced. Um, in terms of some prospects and some really good ideas and some implementations that have at least partly worked and partly achieved some kind of um, uh, some kind of lift off, yes, uh, we do have exemplars to work with. So that in itself um, is not one of the big impediments. There are buzz phrases, alternative social media, distributed social media out there. So we've got to look elsewhere for the real blockages. So what I'm drifting on towards doing is saying that um, the tech engineering side is one set of challenges, but the business engineering side um, has been a considerable challenge to a lot of people. So the entrepreneur faces up to the fact when he's trying to innovate that he's got to have a business model or two or three or succession over a period of years. Um, there are many ways of depicting what a business model is. I use this one. I'm only going to talk about the who pays question uh, briefly here, uh, but uh, the question does come down to how the hell am I going to finance this thing? And there's a number of different categories that are workable in this uh, in, in the modern era. Uh, some of it is the straightforward um, uh, way of doing business, um, finding customers and getting them to pay for something. Another is third parties may pay for the service to other people, especially advertisers, but bear in mind that the idea of a social security agency being prepared to uh, uh, provide, uh, fund uh, the uh, provision of uh, social media uh, for uh, victims of domestic violence, for example, uh, or um, a, the relevant government, government agencies for undercover operatives um, um, or for uh, protective witnesses, um, that's a third party uh, payment mechanism rather than a fairy godmother. There are, of course, particularly in some countries, the USA uh, uh, leads the world in philanthropy, um, uh, as well as a few other things. Um, so the fairy godmother approach uh, can work up to a point. In terms of scalability, uh, not always successfully so, but certainly up to a certain point. And then providers can be interested in this as a complementary service. In the event that there's a freemium premium structure being operated, the premium can pay for the freemium. So the cross subsidization can occur within a single corporation. So there are ways and means, um, but they've got to be business engineered in order to work properly. So having kicked through those sorts of things, what are the remaining impediments that we haven't talked about? Well, we've got product and service inadequacies where uh, designers haven't done a good enough job um, or where the market has moved around them or the infrastructure that they've depended on has moved beneath them. And these sorts of qualities of delivery and so forth have not, uh, have not been satisfied. There's some of that, that's business, that's life. Ineffective business model implementation, ineffective ability to uh, move on from one phase to another phase. Yes, that's a business challenge. And a lack of demand. Well, is it a lack of demand? 
or is it a failure to convert the demand that's out there uh, into a bunch of adopters rather than just watchers or people ignorant about the existence uh, of, my, of my product? Yes, these impediments all remain, but they are all surmountable for the reasons that we've been discussing. There, there is a market, both supply and demand, out there. So what we've got to get down to is uh, the big elephant in the room that I've left until the end, which is uh, the network effects that we depend upon not being able to be achieved and not being able to be achieved because there's a blockage in the system and a substantial one at that. So if the incumbents are minded to prevent and the incumbents are powerful enough to achieve it um, uh, by anti-competitive means, then we've got a problem. How do we break through that? So my remaining few comments are going to have to do with what I see here as, if you like, a political engineering, perhaps better termed a regulatory engineering challenge, um, uh, which is necessary to complement uh, the technical challenges uh, uh, that, uh, that are taken up by engineers. So let's quickly rehearse what competition law is about and why it is there. So economists have argued that um, for centuries that competition enables innovation, that um, enabling an organisation to dominate a sector um, is fine for that organisation and its shareholders, uh, but will have a detrimental effect, not necessarily in the immediate term, but even in the short to medium and certainly in the longer term. It will harm the economy as a whole. And in addition to that, from an economist's point of view, it will harm individual consumers as well. So that's where competition law came from. Uh, different laws are uh, different terms in different countries. The term antitrust is now a bit more used in Europe than it once was, uh, not greatly used in a lot of other countries. Um, uh, call it what we will. Interventions are made by governments in order to address what's referred to by economists as market failure. There's a range of different categories of market failure. Supplier lock-in is, is a big one in some industries. Uh, control um, of the whole coal market or the whole silver market um, is an example of it. Customer lock-in is a big one with high switching costs to move across to a new bank, for example, or control of distribution networks. Uh, some of that is indulged in, in the context we're talking about. Competitor or new entrant lockout mechanisms is the big one that uh, we're facing here. High entry costs for, uh, for anyone getting in, uh, existing dominance of the market and service bundling, which makes it very hard to come in from the edges. That's a big one. There's also a couple of others that have been recognised in more recent years. Um, um, up until now, we're, we're really talking about fairly classical um, uh, economics, uh, but more recent economics talks in terms of the tragedy of the commons which should be reinterpreted as the tragedy of a commons that is unmanaged. And there's also uh, from Stiglitz, uh, again, an economist, but an alternative econ economist, arguing that the there are various kinds of market irrationality. I've mentioned hedon hedonism uh, as one element of market irrationality, uh, which uh, may need to be confronted as well. But we've already agreed, that, or at least I've agreed with myself, uh, that, we, um, uh, that it's pointless for us attacking the oblivious and the hedonists and so forth. We should be focusing on the market segments that are accessible to us. So that's the general framework that we have from competition law. So what have the regulators been doing? Well, I'll start with Australia, not, not primarily because I live here, um, but because um, there has been a very activist um, period in the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission uh, under a recently retired uh, after, after 10 years commissioner by the name of Rod Sims. And each of these steps in the first four bullets has been undertaken. Um, the first one's absolutely mainstream in Australia. We used to call it trade practices law. Uh, absolutely mainstream, but it was undertaken against the big battalions. Um, another very big one, which was the world leading at the time it was done over the last two, three years, has been demands for payments by the tech platforms to local media companies where the uh, tech platforms expropriate content from those lo local media companies. And that's still in the uh, process of playing through in Australia, uh, but quite a lot of uh, agreements have been reached and money is changing hands. And that's been watched by a lot of countries around the world. 
Another study is being done on the dominance of the ad tech supply chain, uh, and that also is in conjunction with multiple regulators around the world. And a recent one, just as an example of something a bit smaller, was that scam celebrity ads in the cryptocurrency markets um, have been uh, allowed through. So it's been a content issue on some of the content, uh, some of the tech platforms, um, and an inadequate ability to discover and to then deal with um, uh, scam ads. Uh, that's been attacked here in Australia. The EU has hardly been quiet, and they, they find companies an awful lot more money than Australia does. Um, uh, so within the EU, various countries and at uh, European Commission level, uh, Google Shopping has been attacked on specific anti-competitive practices, Android operating system, and Google AdSense, critically in the uh, ad tech supply chain area, um, have all been the subject of real action. The USA, I'm sorry, but uh, the rest of the world regards the um, um, uh, Trade Commission as being a, uh, a sham. Um, it, um, it supports American business. It doesn't support American consumers. And of course, that worries the rest of us out in the world because the influence of American regulators ought to be very substantial given the importance of American corporations uh, in all of the fields we're talking about. However, the last year has seen a great deal more pressure put on by Congress across a range of different areas. Uh, some of them quite small scale things to do with content uh, regulation, um, the various kinds of content uh, that we uh, um, uh, that many people will agree uh, shouldn't be up there or should be able to be removed uh, when it does get up there. Um, but some of it has been more substantial and uh, watch this space. I believe we're going to get more action there. So what do we need to do? What we've got to face up to is that we are only going to achieve regulatory engineering if it is lobbied for. It may sound like a horrible, dirty word. Let's use the word advocacy instead of lobbying, uh, because we're the good guys, remember. Um, but we've got to get out there and do it. The IT industry has got to do it, and it's got to do it much more forcefully. But so have IT professional associations. I'm not personally active within IEEE. I'm active within the Australian Computer Society, within the Association of Information Systems. We've got to have policy arms which are fighting for um, public economic interests and public social interests. That's part of our responsibility as technologists. So much as we'd like to be about technical engineering alone, particularly uh, in the IEEE environment, I'm sorry, we have also got to be aware of the social engineering and the regulatory engineering need, and we've got to act in them as organisations, individuals in part, but particularly as collaborations like IEEE and its, and its various arms. I'm not saying it's not being done, but in this area, it's not been um, given as a priority. I believe it's got to be a priority for IEEE, and it's going to have to be, IEEE is going to have to be arm in arms uh, with a range of other associations to get the leverage it needs to get legislatures to listen, to get regulators to face up to the needs. The two key areas uh, that I perceive as being necessary where I believe the real blockages exist are uh, in interoperability, uh, where messaging is concerned, um, the walled gardens uh, have got so much blocked in, uh, both content and traffic. And the other is in the portability of profiles and portability of archives, uh, because those are lock-in techniques that make it more awkward for a person to carry with them their selves as they perceive it, their own um, um, uh, digital persona, uh, in this case, what I refer to as a projected digital persona, that is made up in the things they have with them in their various uh, social media environments. They don't run their own websites anymore like us old fashioned people still do. Uh, so those two areas are the crucial things that we've got to look for from, uh, from uh, anti-competition um, uh, regulatory agencies. Get them to understand that content locked inside walled gardens is good only for the tech platforms. It's bad for innovation. We've got to get the economic argument in there. And it's bad for people. We've got to also convey uh, the, uh, the social need, the social argument. So um, my justification for being here uh, talking to an event that's about applying engineering solutions is apply engineering solutions, but don't expect them alone to work. They are in a context, um, engineers also have to be out there in the social and political contexts, lobbying or advocating hard. Thanks very much, Katina. Um, thanks so much, Roger, for that talk on consumer-oriented social media. So much to unpack.
And some of those issues, actually, Dr. Abbas and I have been thinking about for some time. Uh, most recently, we, we were talking about business models in this space. So um, Roger, you mentioned in your presentation many important points, as Katina mentioned. Thank you so very much for that. One of which was talking to the different contexts, the social, political, organisational and legal. And then toward the end, you mentioned the economic and, and the regulatory context. Um, the question I have is that within these contexts are diverse stakeholders and potentially competing interests. Um, I'd be interested in your thoughts and whether you can comment on how a multi-stakeholder perspective or approach can be applied in the context of um, privacy-friendly social media. Um, so where do we start in terms of considering potentially competing stakeholder interests that may serve as obstacles in the re realisation of these privacy or customer-oriented social media applications? Yes, it's a challenging one, like it always is, but good old stakeholder analysis techniques uh, uh, help bail us out. Um, we need the map of the uh, of the particular environment. Um, it's quite clear that there's a bunch of uh, large scale players uh, in Australia. There's the Tech Council, uh, so the uh, the large modern um, uh, IT. Um, platform organisations have brought themselves together. Uh, so the likelihood of them uh, being uh, particularly friendly towards these ideas isn't high. By the way, it's not zero possibility uh, because um, let's look at it from, from their viewpoint. Supposing they face up to the fact that the world is starting to gang up on them, is awake to their game and doesn't like it anymore and is going to move towards serious regulation. If they wish to, to show a pleasant face to society, they could actually support um, particularly small scale specialised um, competitors, open the gate for those kinds of competitors and design it in such a way that they don't open the gate towards large scale competitors to themselves. So it is actually possible that even the, uh, the tech council tech platforms could come to the party. But let's assume they're the enemy. Um, uh, where else do we go? Where do we find our friends? Um, there's not a huge amount to work with in the, um, in the economic uh, side of the community. There's some because um, uh, there are some effective organisations at any given time in different countries that do represent the smaller players. Um, most entrepreneurs, innovators, scale-ups are too busy um, with their own business to, to spend time on associations, but there are some medium-sized associations that, uh, that may well be, um, uh, be allies. But there's quite a lot of social organisations and some of them have clout. Uh, here in Australia, for instance, we're seeing the Consumers Association, called Choice following the uh, British uh, uh, name, has been having clout in Australia and a couple of issues right as we speak. Um, but there's also Council of Social Services representing the um, uh, lower socioeconomic strata, if you will. Um, now, what we don't have a lot of is people who are representing all of those other uh, categories on the slide I had earlier, the, uh, the persons at risk categories. They're a bit harder to get to, but there are government agencies. Um, there are some small scale associations and there can be some sideways entrances. Sometimes unions get interested in, in some of these issues. Um, 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 another area, certainly victims associations, uh, can be uh, victims of crime and, uh, um, and there has been a big push in government in recent years in multiple governments around the world uh, in the area of victims of domestic violence, very big in Australia uh, uh, over the last two or three years. So there are various kinds of alliances that are, that are possible out there. Of course, getting out to individuals and getting individual stories is by definition hard because these are people who have reason to hide. In some cases, reason to hide their currently used identities and reason to, reason to hide their, uh, their current uh, addresses. Uh, so, so getting individual faces uh, can be more challenging, but associations do exist. It's only a sketch, but <laughs> there are some approaches. Oh, sure. No, they're, they're fabulous um, suggestions, Roger. I think you're quite right in mentioning that those who have reason to hide are not as accessible as others. Um, with that in mind, what do you think of the role or value of something like co-design, co-production, or any of those collaborative design approaches in this context? Do you think that they're feasible, that they would work, given the at-risk category that you identified as part of your talk? 
Yes, there's two sides to the co-design issue. Um, designers have got to be attuned to it, uh, and that's often a barrier. Um, and uh, people have to be found uh, who can work effectively and represent the interests of people. Now, as a person who's who's been in a uh, or in a number of advocacy organisations over the years, it's always an interesting challenge when a parliamentary commission says to you, uh, committee says to you, but but how? Who do you represent? And how do you know that that's what they think? And how do you know that that's what they need? And they're reasonable questions. Um, so finding people who are sufficiently representative, who do have uh, the lived experience, if you will, um, but can also rationalize it, think their way into it, and not go off on their own hobby horses too much. Um, so both sides are challenging, but uh, there's great prospects for it. Um, from a from an engineering perspective, uh, it's now no doubt a, a, an old fashioned term, but the uh, the beta tester uh, uh, collection, uh, the uh, the ways in which you get free um, free insights uh, into the minds of the people that you're trying to reach. Once we expand on those techniques, and once we get out of our ivory towers as developers, okay, I've admitted I'm 25 years away from having done serious uh, software development, but um, once I'll call us we, uh, once we get uh, ourselves out of our ivory tower uh, mindset and get ourselves into that, well, is this going to work? Are people going to want this? Does that interface work for them? I'm sure the functionality is right, but does the interface speak to them or not? And there are ways and means, and we've got to get out there and get across those boundaries. Yes, I think in something like this, co-design's um, uh, much more critical than it is in a large-scale collaboration uh, kind of approach that, uh, that, uh, that a multinational takes. I think you're spot on there, Roger, particularly in regards to the lived experience and something that Katina and I are often discussing and working through as part of our work is how to marry the lived experience with professional expertise in a design process so that the outcome is, is of value, that the outcome encompasses values. Uh, I might ask um, if that's okay, Katina, one more question before handing back to you. And that's sort of stepping back from the individual level and their potential role in co-design, right through to one of the final points that you mentioned, Roger, about the value of regulatory engineering um, and I like the word that you use advocacy so it requires advocacy on the part of technologists professional societies and organizations a, a similar kind of question to my stakeholder question how do you suggest we bring these uh, diverse or different professional associations together particularly with a vision towards multi inter and transdisciplinary approaches which I think um, are required to overcome some of those impediments that you identified, because to, I, I suspect that that is a very real challenge, a practical um, sort of um, uh, next step in the process to get conversations going between these professional societies that otherwise wouldn't have conversations. The IEEE, some of the associations you mentioned, among others. Yes, um, there has been a change in recent years, and I think we've got some better prospects now than we had in the past. Look, I, I have the same feeling as a, as a lot of people um, in the tech fraternity have, that there's an awful lot of ignorance out there amongst all these other disciplines, all these other professions uh, about technology. And do I really want to spend a huge amount of time educating them when I know they're not going to get it because they haven't got the platform of understanding on which to build? Look, I think that's changed a lot. I think in the last decade, we've seen uh, quite a lot of environments. Um, uh, one of the obvious ones is uh, media, uh, media uh, criticism and so forth. There's now a lot more understanding within those communities of the technology than, than there used to be. Another example that I've come across in recent times uh, through the Australian National University in particular is that the security community, and I don't mean computer security, data security or IT security, nor do I necessarily mean national security, but, but the big ground in between the two, um, encompassing uh, the edges of both, um, that community is now highly diverse there are multiple different centres in any given university, each of which has got the term security somewhere in, if not their title, then in the next level down of description. And quite a lot of them have got the capacity to actually interact with the IEEE's, the computer societies of Australia and Britain and, and, and equivalents in Europe. Um, the, they now have um, the capacity to have those conversations without huge adjustments by us techos. Um, now, of course, we've got to do a little bit of adjustment ourselves. We've also got to face up to the um, uh, understanding of policy, understanding of socio-technical systems is, is just a given. 
While ever we keep thinking engineering in the tight old fashioned mechanical engineering sense, uh, the communications just aren't working two way. But, but once, once we're in a socio-technical um, context, um, once we're starting to face up to the fact that the world does have a lot of spit politics in it, uh, and we've got to play at least around the edges of that politics to achieve the outcomes we're trying to get to, uh, once that's faced up to uh, by uh, the stronger engineering fraternities, I think those bridges can be built. Um, so I think it's those sorts of um, university centres of a of a complex kind and you're familiar that <laughs> you're very familiar with, uh, with with some of them um so that's a starting point and that helps to reach out then to associations of, of a professional nature uh, and to individuals scattering scattering around the outside of them people like me who fit in no particular niche uh, there are there are quite a lot of people out there like that who can uh, be part of that uh, of that bridge building so i do think we're in a better position now than the than we were in years ago, but I totally support the uh, the point to underlying your question. Thank you so much, Roger. It's always a pleasure to hear you speak and thank you for answering my questions. Katina? So let's go back to that um, question on business models and how something like this could be possibly funded. You were, I think, pointing towards uh, open social media platforms that were not behind a paywall. A lot of us who use social media have difficulty actually even finding our own posts going back decades, even if we do download all the data sets in totality and we have that access, for example, in more recent times. But what kind of business model, if we should even call it a business model, might work to keep these uh, applications viable? You gave us two lists, one sort of the mainstream social media platforms that most people use uh, or have heard of, and on the right, there's other platforms that in some cases, if we look at Signal platform, uh, have a huge following, um, but perhaps uh, have a different kind of model in terms of supporting uh, the outcomes. Can you comment on that? Is it going to be a business model or is it going to be called something else? Yeah, um, the term business model works well for the information systems community and the uh, observers, the e-business, e-commerce, um, e e-government uh, uh, people. Um, it, it isn't yet a pejorative um, uh, because my who pays for um, for what, to whom, and why um, uh, is a sufficiently general model. It, it acknowledges the that we're in an economic space. Uh, we need resources. Um, uh, they can't. Uh, uh, not everything is free as in air. Um, so we face up to some economics mixed in with uh, fulfilling social needs. So to me, it's still a workable frame. For people who don't like it and, and who want to adopt a much more socialist, communitarian, whatever you, you like to call it, perspective, you could approach it a little bit differently, but then you're still going to have to end up with words like sponsors. Uh, I prefer fairy godmother. It sounds so much nicer a, a word to me. Um, look, I think each of the categories I've got there uh, can be glossed, if you like, can be represented in different wordings that get it to ease away from the economics if, the, if they need to be. Um, there is a free service available to, um, I'm postulating here, uh, there is a free service available to victims of domestic violence, uh, which will not only provide you with a new handheld with a new SIM in it, uh, which has in effect a new identity. Um, and um, we want you to be careful with how you use this because it will escape if you're not careful. And we've ported some data very carefully from several public places about you and put it into that SIM and into this new closed social media area, which currently has one member, which is you. Be very, very careful who you invite into that little world of yours in this social media area. Now, that's funded by a government agency. It's got to be. I mean, that's that's a government service uh, to uh, to rescue people from the from the dismal positions that they're in. Now. If they were permanently in that situation, if they're under fatwa and they're going to be hiding for the rest of their lives, it's a different matter. But a lot of victims of domestic violence, it isn't forever. It's for absolutely crucial, sometimes not short term, but uh, for an absolutely crucial period of physical safety, not to mention mental safety. Um, but it does have an end date and eventually some relaxation um, of, of some of the security uh, features may be, may be possible. In the interim, it's a public service. Uh, 
So that's one where the fairy godmother should be a government agency uh, providing the funding for this. Um, and you'll find plenty of um, um, uh, corporate sector prepared to put quiet money in, um, um, uh, in some cases in kind, in other cases in cash to support such things. So start uh, uh, low, low hanging fruit. I mean, start with the things that, uh, that can be got to quickly. Um, the US government is happy to fund um, protections for human rights uh, workers in threatened countries that are currently on the US government's not liked list. They're not quite so happy about them in some other countries, but there are plenty of countries uh, where America is the land of the free and is trying to reject the land of the free and ensure more freedoms in quite a lot of other countries in the world and good for America for doing it. So uh, getting uh, through that kind of funding system could ensure that and, and to pick a, 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 we'd have hoped it was a borderline case, Thailand, which is one where I've had a bit of experience of the difficulties that uh, human rights advocates are under in what we'd have thought was an emergent um, civilized country. Uh, at times, it's been very, very nasty there. So you'd hope for um, that as another, in this case, it's another fairy godmother one. And the other one that I think is uh, uh, as big is the premium premium combination. There are people out there who are both investors um, um, and provide uh, and provide considerable amounts of funding uh, into um, uh, good works. And the combination of those two things can work well for multiple parties. You can build a viable business, not necessarily a multinational or not necessarily a large scale multinational, but you can build one uh, in the premium space um, with plenty good enough spin off and uh, clearly uh, selling to um, under, uh, organizations that have undercover operatives who need protection. Um, I hope it didn't come over that I was being negative there. Uh, undercover operatives are a fact of life and are necessary in quite a lot of contexts and they need protection and they need to have social media because they're highly suspect to the people who they are associating with if they aren't visible on social media. So, um, okay, you can have multiple identities, but uh, it still becomes a challenge. So um, the freemium premium uh, has, uh, has real prospects. They're the two ones, two that I would see most if I was I'm not an investor in this field, but if I was to become an investor in this field, uh, uh, move into uh, those, that kind of entrepreneurial work, uh, they're the two fields I'd be looking at myself. Not sure whether that really answered your question, but it scattered around the outside of it a bit. No, it does. It does. Uh, it did address it right on. Um, a question on penalties now, Roger. Have we gone far enough? And what are the responses by organisations that offer uh, social media services? Are they listening to the penalties? Uh, is there change being enacted as a result? Um, and how do we get that message uh, to Silicon Valley, for example? Uh, I think the short answer is yes, although, of course, it's more complicated than that. Uh, the numbers have now become sufficiently appreciable, so they're noticed. Uh, they're not simply flicked through to the uh, to the 14th assistant level. Um, so that, that has helped. Uh, we don't have that here in Australia. We're still talking in uh, three zeros on the end of a fine. It uh, does, doesn't have any effect whatsoever. Um, uh, but the, uh, Europe and the US are, are well beyond that. Canada is well beyond that. So, uh, yes, I believe that is uh, it's being noticed. Now, is it causing sufficient change yet? It's causing more than a little thought. There is now, at the very worst, you could call it posturing. There is posturing by multiple of the tech platforms. There are statements that they're going to do things. I mean, facial recognition uh, technologies is, uh, is an example uh, where, this is, uh, where this has been changing. It's not exactly in the social media space, but it's not outside it either. Um, so... Um, uh, and facial recognition has been uh, on the move again in Australia just recently. So some of the quite large organisations on an Australian scale have taken notice of um, complaints levelled, um, which are now to be looked at by a fairly weak regulator. So, yes, I believe we are getting traction. Um, the public is sufficiently, or enough of the public, is sufficiently upset that the messages are starting to get through. Uh, so I, I, I think we have the ability to, to achieve change there. But remember, my, my argument here is that appealing to Mark Zuckerberg's better self isn't the most effective way to achieve change. Um, uh, he can reasonably say, uh, switch to my um, company chairman, company secretary, company director mode. Um, I am not permitted 
to do things in the public interest as a company director. The law precludes me from doing so. My responsibility is emphatically to the company, normally interpreted as the shareholders. Uh, so if I'm Mark Zuckerberg now with a very substantial body of shareholders, I can't actually be Mr. Nice Guy all the time unless I can show that it's for the benefit of the shareholders to do so. So don't look there. Zuckerberg's got to look to the regulators to kick him in the line. Then he can say to the shareholders, I have to do this. Otherwise, we're going to be copying worse than billion dollar fines. We're going to be copying some real constraints and antitrust moves to break us up. This is not good for you shareholders. So we have actually got to move into the regulatory realm to make it easier for big business to move in the directions we want them to. So we discussed a, a number of um, ways within which we can get the ear of companies uh, around the world that offer social media services. Do you think the most powerful voice are citizens? Not in the sense of the ability to have the direct impact um, on the decision makers. In terms of the welling up of support, the public is the reference point. If a regulator is trying something on and goes to the legislature, goes to the, uh, the influential members uh, in, in, in Congress, the question is going to be asked, I haven't heard much about this. Is, is, is there a problem? Um, yeah, yeah, I, I get the theory. I get the theory, but, 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 but show me where the real problem is. Who's upset? Who's bashing down what doors? Well, if the public is willing up, and if it's quite clear on the radio, uh, sorry, the, <laughs> the newspaper clippings, I was going to say, but that's a really old fashioned word. Uh, the, the quotations out of the media uh, come tumbling down on the desk in front of the senator. The senator is no longer saying, show me the evidence, who's upset? Because it's there. Uh, that's, a, that's a given. So the public is a, is a must. Uh, and that public is, of course, individuals, because the media and the senators like real live people. But it's also the advocacy organisations shuffling the information into some kind of structure and making that one page look convincing and researched. So it's a combination of things with the public as a, as, as a, as a useful, valuable part, essential part even, uh, of the engine room underneath. Uh, I'm going to mention the word metaverse, uh, since we just spoke about Zuckerberg a moment ago. Um, what does that conjure up in your ideas with respect to your presentation? First thing it's always conjured up in my mind is that uh, Zuckerberg's running out, running out of ideas. Uh, it's an ancient, ancient idea. Um, and uh, I can't believe he's recycled it and, think, and I can't believe that people are letting him get away with it. But there you go. Um, if it works uh, for business, it works for business. Um, to the extent that um, uh, MySpace uh, comes back again, uh, to the event that we uh, rediscover virtual worlds and uh, and forget about all the things that didn't work in virtual worlds, to the extent that it comes back, it will add to the hedonistic feel um, inside social media. It will cause a bigger proportion of people to be oblivious uh, or, if they're aware, to happily trade off anything in order to get this fun experience because I'm all about having fun. Um, so those people will become even more of a lost cause uh, than they are now. Um, caveat emptor and uh, individual self-determination, uh, we've got to allow them to do that. Sorry, a lot of people will continue to be beguiled. Uh, so yes, it will um, increase or bring another round of, um, of, that, of that belief. But remember that Facebook is suffering from the middle age syndrome. It's got a paunch now. Uh, the young people aren't going there. It was always the story that once the thing had been around long enough, there were too many old people on it, where old is uh, defined to be over 35 now, I think. Um, and the young people will be somewhere else because they don't want their parents and their uncles and their aunts in the same place as them. Uh, so Facebook's suffering from a fair bit of that. And I'm not sure whether Facebook can pull this off, even if virtual reality were to be useful. Uh, but more generally, will the next big thing that comes along after Facebook that is going to move Facebook back into the dustbin of history, will that be more compelling? And could that cause us difficulties in getting consumer orientation into social media? Yes, there is a risk factor. Um, there will be another wow factor, even if it's not virtual reality, even if it's not called by a fancy name like Metaverse. Um, so yes, there will be more threats. The, the game is over, but we can fight it with the same tools I'm talking about here. 
Uh, Roger, if you had one message for Silicon Valley involved in digital privacy and social media offerings, uh, what would it be? The time's come. You knew it was going to come, uh, but the public's much more aware of what you're up to than ever it was before. Uh, the public's talking to the regulators. The regulators are talking to you, and soon they'll be waving sticks at you and bigger sticks as time goes by. It's happened in the lead countries, Australia and, and various European countries already. Uh, the US is next. Um, move. Uh, get ahead of it. You've generally been extremely good at holding off genuine regulation by doing enough to satisfy legislatures that you are addressing the problem without them hitting you with a big stick, you'd better move quickly and get your house in order right now. Thank you so much. Um, do you have any last thoughts and reflections, Roger? Apart from the fact I've been asked some hard questions I had to, uh, I had to work with. Uh, no, no, that's been very good. Thank you, Katina. As always, I uh, very much enjoyed these interactions, as you can, as you can well, uh, uh, as you well understand. So uh, thank you very much for that. And I look forward to doing some more like these some other time. Thank you so much to you, Rover, and to Roger, uh, our presenter today. today. So in a few weeks, we'll assemble all uh, at Silicon Valley in California and actually get those regulators together with service providers and members of the public and see this debate and these issues be raised to the fore together. I think you're right, Robo, this requires a transdisciplinary approach uh, to addressing these global issues, not just local. And Roger, um, ascertaining the approaches you talked about in getting into the ear of companies offering these services is highly important. And you provided for us some excellent tools and mechanisms by which to do that. Thank you so much to you both. Hello and welcome to a pre-recorded session of the IEEE International Symposium on Digital Privacy and Social Media being held in San Jose on the 1st of August 2022. My name is Katina Michael, I'm the chair of the symposium and I'd like to give a shout out to the IEEE Consumer Technology Society for whom made this symposium possible when they realised that they required this kind of interaction between a variety of stakeholders to come together to talk about pressing concerns in the creation of consumer electronics with respect to digital privacy and social media. I'd also like to thank for their support and panel uh, presentation, the IEEE Digital Privacy Initiative that's doing wonderful things within IEEE with respect to privacy. And of course, the IEEE Society on the Social Implications of Technology, whose technical committee, Socio-Technical Systems, led by Dr. Robert Abbas, is also supporting this event. Today we have with us Professor Roger Clark from Zamex Consultancy. He is also a well-known visiting professor at the University of New South Wales and the Australian National University. And he'll be talking today about consumer-oriented social media, key features, what's held it up and how we get it. Welcome Roger and welcome Dr. Robert Abbas. Thank you, 